Thanks. Um, so on behalf of the link, uh, my name is Craig Davis, and um, I'd like to uh, thank everybody for being here today. Uh, this is a special occasion for us, and we're really glad that you guys could all be part of it. Um, so what I'd like to do is go ahead and um, introduce Steve Mulling to come up here, and he's going to share a few words. Thank you, Craig. And for those who don't know Craig Davis, uh, he was recently promoted the president of Mulling Corporation, so he has succeeded me. I'm, I'm of course, staying, still staying very involved as CEO, but um, Craig is running day-to-day -day operations as president, and I'm kind of focusing on long-term um, goals and strategies. Um, I also want to recognize just a few people. I'd love to recognize most, if not all, of you. Um, but um, I have to recognize my mother. Um, she's not able to stand up. Jean Malink had nine kids and uh, just had her uh, 90th birthday. And, uh, and she is with um, two of my siblings, Gina Malink. Um, Gina and her husband, Michael. <laughs> my brother, Tony. And I, I don't know if our visitors from Korea were able to make it in. Like, um, is Mr. Chung here? Yes, here he is. There he is. Mr. Chung from Korea came. came <laughs> Many of you came from um, from all over. I appreciate uh, you guys taking the time to come here and celebrate with us our 30th anniversary and uh, checking us out, our building, and our people, uh, of which I'm most proud of. Um, and I just wanted to uh, take you through a quick presentation, um, the title of which is The Clean Energy Revolution is Here. I know. Many of you don't work as closely as we do to um, this industry, but I would like to educate you a little bit more on what clean energy is and what is this revolution that I'm talking about. So I only have two purposes. This is uh, going to take a little, a little more than 30 minutes, but I'd like to educate you on um, how it is a strategic advantage for businesses, but also for you as individuals uh, with homes and, and how you can um, turn it into a competitive um, you know, financial advantage. Secondly, to inspire you on why you should lead rather than follow this revolution. This is uh, akin to the computer revolution, the internet revolution, and um, there's benefits to leading the, the way. What, why is energy, first of all, so important? Because it is so integral in our lives. Uh, and everything from our homes, our appliances, our smartphones, our cars, uh, the businesses in which we operate. Um, and then it's probably just take for granted that you, you could just plug something into the wall and the energy is going to be there. But where does it come from? So I'm, I'm here to just make the case that energy is the number one input to our 21st century way of life. Now, we take it for granted, and we shouldn't do that for a few reasons. One is the, the fuels of the past, the throughout the 1900s, have been dirty fuels, whether it's coal, oil, or nuclear. And um, we need to move to a brighter future involving cleaner fuels. Natural gas is a fossil fuel, but it's 50% cleaner than, uh, than coal. But solar and wind is the way of the future. It's, it's um, clean, free, and abundant. So we hear so much, this is a political speech, but we hear so much about coal being, uh, you know, we're going to resurrect the coal industry and create jobs and everything. But uh, the fact of the matter is, um, we're in this industry, coal is not the future. It, it, is the, it is the energy of the past, and the energy of the 21st century is going to be the free that I just showed you. Um, and it's not because of, of solar and wind per se, it's more due to the natural gas revolution that has been taking place the last, the last 10 years. So the idea of blowing, blowing up mountaintops and shipping this, this, uh, this material, burning it and disposing of waste, that made sense at a time when we had nothing better at the time. But 
now we do. Natural gas, as I mentioned, though it is cleaner, it is only a transitional fuel. It'll, it'll bite us time until such time we can um, move into a, a, a completely clean energy future. And um, you know, so people say, well, gosh, Deepers, you've got 200 years of natural gas that we can tap into. Um, and, well, how sure are we of that? You know, maybe it's 100 years. Is there, is there a possibility there's only 50 years as, as the world demand for natural gas uh, increases exponentially? So it is a limited natural resource. There's only so many holes that you can poke in the ground and pull this stuff up out of the ground before you have to poke more holes in the ground and repeat uh, the process over and over again. In, in the method in which we're doing it, fracking um, involves inserting a chemical, high pressure, uh, and injecting it into the ground um, below the, um, the water table. And there's, there's a lot of environmental concerns. A lot, number of states have banned fracking. So there's a lot of risks to it, is what I'm suggesting. Solar and wind, solar and wind again, is free, it's clean, and it's abundant. Why in the 21st century don't we move more swiftly into these uh, technologies of the future? I would also say that energy diversity is key. So many people say, well, you know, we've got all the coal we need or we've got all the natural gas we need, but we've already learned from, from ages past that there's the boom and bust cycles. Um, the more diversity we have, the more competition there will be, um, the fewer um, and boom and bust cycles we go through, and the less risk you'll naturally have if you have a diversified portfolio. So you as investors, I would imagine you're all trying to diversify your investment portfolio to minimize risk. You're not going to put everything into Apple stock. You're going to put some into mutual funds, bonds, real estate maybe, and spread out your holdings. And then you're not going to get burned by any one incident. Same thing with energy. Same, you should be taking the same approach. The global energy forecast is uh, one that's going to, that's going to, um, demand is going to double in the next 30, 40, 50 years. So as the world's population goes from, um, what is it, it's close to 8 billion, I believe, now to 11 to 12 billion in the, in the next 30 to 50 years, not only is it the population, but as other um, countries like China, India, Brazil, they want a, a, a lifestyle like ours, they want more refrigerators, air conditioning units, cars, um, the demand for energy is going to um, explode. So how are we going to meet this demand? And who's going to own the clean energy age? So we as Americans can take pride that in the fact, in the fact that in the 20th century we owned all the major ages of the past. We owned the automobile industry. We electrified our country. Um, we own the flight age, the space age, the computer age. It was American ingenuity and innovation. Good old capitalism you know, took America to um, you know, where we are today. But in the 21st century, it's not going to be those, those areas that's going to propel the next uh, country or economy. It's going to be solar, wind, electric cars, battery storage, and smart grids. And guess what? China is investing heavily in all of those. And the risk is, is I mean, it's not just a risk, but it's a, a likely scenario that they're going to own the, um, the clean energy age and, and all those great opportunities. And we're going to be buying solar panels and battery technologies and everything else, electric cars even, from China, rather than us selling it to them. So in the same way, you know, we often read that it's been a, um, a problem that we're buying oil from the Middle East. We're exporting our wealth and sending our wealth over to um, dangerous parts of the world. The same situation is going to arise where we're exporting our wealth to China. These are the ones that are investing in the manufacturing of all this stuff. So they're investing in clean energy because of a super nexus. What is a super nexus? It is that there's economic opportunities in doing that, investing in clean energy, from the manufacturing 
to the installation, um, to the servicing. Also, the security aspects. Those who are more uh, energy independent are going to be more secure as a country. So we often talk about that. We want to become energy independent. And in fact, the president wants to do that. But I would submit that we should just do it in a different way. Rather than going back to 20th century means, let's go before 21st century means. So you know that we're, you know, the, the cost of, of uh, utilizing our military to keep open the shipping lanes over in the Middle East, for example, that, that cost is not reflected in the price of oil. It's, it's, called, it, it's called an external cost, but it, it probably should be. What about the other external cost of health? We know that China has a problem with its air pollution, and we have, in the past, had problems with air pollution. We've been able to deal with it, but China is seeing, again, that super nexus of the economy, security, and health. They need to make this transition, and they're investing accordingly. And then there's the environmental impacts. So we, we are reading more and more about the increased frequency and severity of droughts, storms, and um, fires, and um, it's only going to get worse. And we're not the only ones here in the U.S. seeing these effects. But for me, and then for many other people, the biggest concern of all is climate change. This is the game changer. So we're already seeing that the, um, that the oceans are acidifying and the Corals in the oceans are dying off. Um, corals are, in many ways, they're the foundation of our um, eco, of all ecosystems, because you know it's it's all the sea life that you know begins there ultimately. That one one species feeds the next, all, all the way up to the, the very largest. Of course, we as a human species depend on that ocean for life and sustenance. Um, there's the polar ice caps. Um, just over in the last 15, 20 years, the market decreases the amount of ice on the North Pole and South Pole. Um, in the next probably 30 years, there's going to be little to no ice at all. I mean, our kids will, will see this, and our grandkids will only be hearing about what a polar ice cap was. And then similarly, there's the, um, the snow packs in the mountains that so many civilizations depend on for water. So um, there's already communities in Peru and elsewhere where these uh, snowpacks are melting um, before they get through the summer, and they have, they have no other means for water. So imagine that uh, the Himalayas, in that part of the world, in Asia, that feed the most populous parts of the world, as those snowpacks melt and then you've got May, June, July, August, with no more water coming down you know, the mountains and feeding the streams and the rivers. What are billions of people going to do with no water? So I'm concerned about it. And again, so many other people are that this is a universal problem. This isn't like you know, a, um, a small insular problem. It's also progressive. It's only going to get worse. No matter what we do today, it's going to get worse. Lastly, it's irreversible, at least in our lifetimes. This is going to continue to, to um, CO2 levels are going to continue to rise uh, for hundreds of years. And so if we, if we think, if, if we're hearing and reading more and more about the effects of climate change today, just imagine what's going to be in 10 years, 20, 30, 50, 100, 200. So here's a map just of the United States. And again, we're not even the first to really see the most devastating effects of climate change. But in 100 to 200 years, many cities in the US will be underwater. And this isn't my opinion. This is based on scientific uh, consensus from the climate scientists. I'm not a climate scientist. I would imagine none, no one here is. Um, I better rely on what the scientists are telling me. Uh, I'm an engineer, and I, I go on data. It's because of data we have lights, we have air conditioning, we have airplanes, we have cars. It's because of data. And data is able to you know, obviously tell us things that opinions cannot. 
So if we thought that the refugee crisis that happened in Europe due to the problems in Syria was a problem of a million people migrating across the continent of Europe and all the dislocations that caused, imagine the, the dislocations that will be caused with uh, climate change. So as more and more cities flood, go underwater, millions, and really billions of people are going to have to move. What has been the international response? China, again, is seizing the super nexus. They're, they're, they're leading the way by a long shot. Europe is also being a leader, reducing their carbon footprint, while the U.S. now is politicizing and blaming more and more. So again, this is meant to be a political speech, because ultimately, I don't see the government as being the solution. We'll get to that later. Well, I don't want to be here just uh, being a harbinger of, <coughs> of bad news. There, there are causes for hope. And the U.S. has taken an important role in the past. We invented solar power. Well, and then China took that invention and are manufacturing it to the point where we are buying solar panels from China now, today. Germany and Europe were a leader in deploying the solar across um, the, you know, the countries. And then the U.S. kind of was watching what was going on, and then back in the Bush administration, good for him, um, they uh, passed a uh, federal investment tax credit into the law that spurred the development of the solar and wind industries. And you can kind of see that over time, the industry has gone from almost nothing in the year 2000 up to 2013. And, and of course, this, this growth is only going higher and higher. So, and not only did the federal government get its act together, many states got their act together. They implemented what is called uh, renewable portfolio standards. So each, many states, more than I think 30, have put in their own standards that require that so much of their generation come from renewable um, or clean energy. Ohio, in fact, was a leader 10 years ago. It had a very strong standard and uh, it kind of put Ohio out there as being a national leader, creating you know, thousands of jobs. Going back to the U.S., we developed a clean power plan, and you know, we we're going to cut carbon pollution by 30 percent by 2030. All positive steps. We, we have faced these kind of environmental challenges in the past with the ozone layer, with acid rain. We've been able to get our act together in the past, but you know, we live in a more politicized time. And there's also the Paris Climate Accord. That, the U.S. Clean Power Plan was really a response to the fact that the world was coming together, recognizing this is a global problem, that we better get our act together and, and, and come up with an agreement. Over 200 countries got together in Paris in 2015 and signed the accord pledging to these, uh, um, these um, carbon reductions. even was being led by the faith community. Um, Pope Francis issued his encyclical on the environment and rallied the, the, the Catholic community at the least and, and really the faith communities at large. That this, this is a serious problem and that we need to, this is a moral responsibility. Then what happened in 2016? So, uh, full disclosure, I have voted Republican for most of my adult life, and um, and I agree with some of what's going on in terms of you know, tax reform and uh, infrastructure bill. There's, there's some good opportunities here. But at the risk of uh, maybe seeming, uh, um, taking myself too seriously, I thought you should realize that <laughs> I don't want to be seen here as taking myself seriously, but I do take the issue seriously. So let's talk about facts versus politics. The facts are that coal as an industry has about 86,000 jobs across the country. Solar dwarfs that with over 400,000 jobs. The wind industry over 100,000. So again, you know, the idea of resurrecting the coal industry to go back to the past when it's really the solar and wind which is growing like this 
that is the opportunity that we've got to be seizing and and making a, a, a national priority. By the way, Arby's has 80,000 jobs. So, you know, a whole industry almost can't compete with one restaurant chain. More facts. Let's talk science. The CO2 parts per million level is the highest ever in human history. Uh, global temperatures, the highest ever. And I think 15 of the 16 highest average temperatures have taken place in this um, century alone. And you correlate that with the world population and the ever increasing energy use. And it's, you know, it's, at least for someone like myself, um, the data is adding up. Now, on the flip side, I, I, I see a lot, I hear, I read about opinions and a lot of, you know, casting doubt kind of thing. It's not a perfect science. I mean, we're learning more and more um, over time. But there is no doubt that the consensus is that this is a serious problem. 97% of all climate scientists agree on that. And so it's not like it's just 10%. The fossil fuel industry obviously has something to lose in this. As a result, they're funding political campaigns and blogs for the purpose of sowing doubt about renewables. You know, solar and wind doesn't work. It's uh, intermittent, costs too much. I can go on and down, down the list of, of reasons why we shouldn't be doing solar and wind. Also, casting doubt about the science of climate change. And, you know, find these little nits and gnats where you know, we don't have perfect answers. In my opinion, it's just massive greed repeating itself all over again that we have seen throughout history by entire industries, and the most notable one being the, the tobacco industry. If you look at all the, you know, uh, on the, the skylines of our major cities, what is the one industry that is most represented out there? And it's the energy industry. It's the Duke Energy in Cincinnati, it's the ADP in Columbus, it's the first energy in Toledo, it's the Dayton Power and Light in Dayton. Every city has this big massive building because they've got a, almost typically a virtual monopoly in selling you their product. So again, they've got a lot to lose by this whole clean energy idea and climate change idea that they're part of a problem. Just like we had many people denying that there was, a, there was addiction um, due to nicotine. So it's easy for any one of us to fall victim. Because number one, climate change has never happened before. There's no history for it. How do we really know it's happening? Even, you know, probably even more logically, it's, it's the slow motion nature of climate change. Most disasters are, you know, I mean, terrorism that happens like this. We can see it. We can see who caused it. Sees the cask land, but the slow motion nature of it is, you know, is it really happening? And it seems so subtle. Do we have to worry about it? In my mind, because it's universal, it's progressive, and it's irreversible. Yeah. Of course, there's so many other priorities out there. Convenient lies by the fossil fuels. It's not happening. It's a hoax by China. In my opinion, the only reason that that China would want us to think that that is a hoax is so that they can win the super nexus. They want us to believe, I mean, you know, we're, we're succumbing to their, uh, to the administration's own imaginings in a way, um, but I mean, believe me, China wants to win the greatest opportunity in the 21st century. Another excuse is, well, it's happening, but it's a normal cycle. This has been going on for, for millions of years, kind of thing. No, it's not. If you look at the data, every couple hundred years, the temperatures are going like this. And then over the last 150 years, it's going up like this. The last excuse is, what's happening, but there's nothing we can do. China, India, we can't control them. If they're not going to get into the, into the game, why should we? I mean, what a pathetic excuse for not getting involved in leading and, and being part of the solution. So again, 97% of scientists agree, not 10%, 97%. What if 97% of the doctors, let's say you went to 100 doctors and 97 of them said, you're going to get lung cancer if you keep smoking. 
Like, is your response going to be, you mean you're not 100% sure? If you're not 100% sure, I'm not going to stop smoking. That's, that's been our response as a country. If there's only a 10% chance of climate change, I think we need an insurance policy against a large scale disaster. Because again, this is going to only become progressive and it's going to get worse. So if by the end of the century, the, um, <coughs> the average global temperature increases by as much as six, seven, eight degrees, it's going to be game over. Not right at the year 100, but that means systems have already been put in place where it's just going to continue to go on and on so that by the next century, it's, it's going to be close, close to game over. If there's just a 10% chance of that, don't we want to be, you know, be proactive today? The, the stakes are way too huge, even at a 10% chance. But the scientists are saying, no, it's not just a 10% chance. This, this is happening. But yet we're still being complacent. We need more data, not less. So, you know, uh, agree, again, I agree with some of the, the strategies and goals of the president, but not the idea that we're going to cut back on research to fulfill his own opinion that climate change doesn't doesn't add up. We need more data. We need to be helping lead the world in this effort. Ohio politics is myopic too. As I mentioned, Ohio was formerly a national leader with our um, renewable portfolio standard. Um, then things got political. Fossil fuels companies saw what was happening and um, you've heard of the same pay to play. Well, guess what? I, I witnessed that time and time again in state politics, going up to Columbus, and I can see that the legislators are being virtually bought by the fossil fuel and utility industries to carry forward their agenda. In utilities, they're in the legislate versus innovate uh, mode. I mean, they're, they're not trying to solve these problems. They're they're, they're just trying to constantly change the laws to work in their favor. So they've always had the monopolies and will always be dependent on their, their mode of delivery. The good news is revolutions are really led by presidents and state legislators. Who are revolutions led by? Us. Well, and there are governments out there, believe it or not, including the city of Cincinnati, Larry Falcon, he's a leader, everybody I don't know if you know, Larry Falcon is, is, a, is a leader. He has done so much for our city in making us a, a leader in that regard. So please, everyone, get him up. <laughs> you know, it's not a political thing. I mean, there's the city of Austin, Texas, and many other cities in the U.S., but countries around the world are taking action. For them, it's not a political issue. In colleges and universities, across the land are also making um, zero carbon pledges. We're saying that by the year 2030, the year 2040, we're going to have a zero energy um, or a zero car carbon footprint. These are just some in our region, but know that there are hundreds of universities who are saying this, that we are going in this direction with or without any government. But even better, corporations and businesses are leading the way. Guess what? The most successful, the largest businesses in our country are setting the example. So don't listen to what I say. Listen to what Google says and Walmart and Procter & Gamble and Hewlett Packard and Ikea and so many others. Now, we're not seeing that so much because most of these companies are not based here in Ohio and even Cincinnati. But it, it's a different world outside of our little uh, bubble here in Ohio. And, and even more so uh, in other parts of the world. Tesla. Probably read that just recently its market cap exceeded Ford Motor Company. Selling electric cars, solar panels, and batteries. Again, that's three of the four or five technologies I said that will become um, part of the 21st century economy. You say, good for them, but how is this relevant to me? I'm, I'm just a homeowner, I'm employing a company, or 
or whatever, well, with switching, switching from mainframes to personal computers relevant to you? Absolutely. It change your lives, too, as homeowners, as employees. Energy is just a strategic. So, here you are at Boeing Corporation, our super green building. Here's an aerial photograph. Mostly what you see are the solar panels, but there's a lot more behind the scenes. You know, we've got a super insulated envelope. We have a geothermal HPC system. Um, we now have LED lights. Uh, we have, of course, the solar and the wind, the solar thermal. This has been a laboratory to, you know, of trying new technologies and strategies and seeing what works best. What we've learned is anybody can do this stuff. We also tried to do it in a way that was maybe architecturally inspiring. That people would say, well, look at your building. It's beautiful. I'd like to have one of those buildings too. And of course, our thought process couldn't end with the building. We, we thought about all the gas guzzling cars in our parking lot. We thought, is that the way of the future? And so we installed charging stations. We incentivized our employees to, if they're in the market for a car, please go out and upgrade to an electric car and then plug into our charging station and charge with the solar electrons rather than using Tetra. And then along the way, another discovery was that the ultimate form of energy is human energy. And as a business owner, I, I feel like in some ways I've been able, been able to tap into something that, is, that I think is very important. That um, you know, there's a, a cultural element to what we've done here. There's a leadership element that employees are very proud to be part of. And that this has kind of expanded our story beyond just the energy savings to what I'll call the, um, might be in a future slide, the HR and PR benefits. So anyway, we, we don't take the simplistic approach that, well, only if the payback is less than two or three years, only then will we install the technology. We see that all the time when we go out to our customers. That's the mentality. So give me a payback for two or three years, and then I'll install your product. You need, you need to take a life cycle cost approach. Look at the product over its life of 10, 20, 30 years. And what would you be paying otherwise? And what are, what are the accrued benefits or the accrued costs? And look at it that way. Discount those cash flows. And then you have a more sophisticated, truer look at what the economic benefit is. So again, far beyond the energy savings of what this building does for us, it's been the HRPR benefits. We are now able to attract and retain talent that we would not have been able to attract 10 years ago. We were just a company selling widgets and, and um, companies selling widgets are a dime a dozen. We're a commodity, right? So be able to find a special place where your values are aligned with their values and there's a synergy there and people believe in what they're selling and doing, that's priceless. So culture is more important than strategy. For our company, our three core values are integrity, service excellence, and innovation. And um, you know, I think more and more companies are realizing culture is really where it's at. That's where you tap into that human energy portion. So again, we we in our world, you know, we have this this, um, this closed-minded um, short-term way of thinking that you know, it's all about payback. And oftentimes the people who are telling me, well, Steve, it's not less than a two or three year payback, I'm not interested, but then I'll notice that they're driving a lux, you know, electric car, or they've got, from getting to know them, they've got a, a vacation home, or they're, they're ready to go on a, a nice um, cruise or something like that. How, how do we justify that we don't want to save energy and money, but we're willing to spend money for other things? So it's just for me, it's an interesting mental exercise to go through. How, how do people justify these two different ways of thinking? 
And what about the external costs again? That do we really want to buy dirty power if we know we're part of a larger problem? Yeah, you know, we want affordable, reliable electric power, but are we willing to do it at any cost? So various groups have put together what they believe is the cost, the total cost of all these external costs. They're saying it's $20 per ton of carbon. So just be thinking that you know it's not just the energy supply, who are you buying from, but to what degree are we as energy users part of the problem? We're buying dirty power. Do we have to? No. So I want to I want this to be an educational process where you're more informed as buyers because you, you, customers are kin. You can you can buy whatever you want. So this is all ending up to some, a revelation to me as a, as a business owner is that your brand is everything. And I would say that to, that to every business and to every person as an individual, your brand is everything. And I don't want my brand, my company's brand, to be about doing the wrong thing by my kids or their kids. I think there's value in that. There's emotional payback in that. I'm willing to pay more for my energy, if necessary, to know that I'm doing the right thing. Here's my house. Again, I went, I went from this building to the cars in the parking lot to, okay, what am I doing at my house? And I, I made a mortal mistake earlier by forgetting to introduce my wife, Mary Francis. <laughs> so, yeah, this is just a regular house, but um, that's, I'm in trouble. <laughs> This is a regular house, but you know we've been able to green it up. It's not it's not zero energy, but it's near zero energy. So over time, we've been able to do things as we can afford to do it. We've super insulated our attic. We've installed the LEDs. We installed triple pane windows. We installed a heat pump, uh, water heater, uh, geothermal HVAC system. You can see the solar PV panels on the side, but you know. Again, everybody can do this a little bit at the, at the time as the budget allows. Again, um, I, the last thing I want for you to walk away from this meeting thinking, okay, you, you said a lot of great things, but I don't feel any, I don't feel empowered on what I can do specifically. You said again, insulation, windows, geothermal, LEDs, solar. Do it a little bit at a time. You, everybody can get there. Let's say you don't have the money right now to do it. Well, what's your next best option? Is to buy 100% green energy. So when you guys are getting your Duke Electric bill, and your bill, let's say it's 1,000 kilowatt hours a month on average, is what you're, how much energy you're pulling from the grid. If you spend just a small premium of half a cent per kilowatt hour, um, you can get them buy green energy for you. So they'll go to a wind farm out in Iowa and, and buy that. Five dollars a month. For the price of a Starbucks coffee, you can free your conscience and know that you're doing the right thing by future generations for one Starbucks coffee. If you don't have the time to invest in all these technologies at your home and realize the savings yourself. For those who are in their 20s, I'm going to say you all have a, a million dollar opportunity that over the next 50 years, as homeowners, you can save enough electric, natural gas, petro, by replicating what we, we, we learned too late to realize that million dollar opportunity. Um, so start investing now as you can, and you're going to realize the savings. Because over time, the cost of electric is going to increase, and if you can Again, reduce your bill usage through energy efficiency and by renewable energy, the savings go in your pocket. Again, with the car, with the car situation, go with electric, and we say, well, a lot of people, lots of arguments, everything. The argument has been that you buy an electric car, you plug into the grid, now some coal plant 100 miles away is burning more coal. Well, get around that problem, put solar on your house, and let the solar panels feed your car. 
Building industry vision and goals. I'm, I'm, um, you know, this is a, a, a still a vision, but it's, it's a, the whole industry is rallying around it. The idea that by 2030, all new buildings should be net zero energy. The codes are improving every year to where the standards getting tougher and tougher. So that I believe that is that, 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 that's realistic. The tougher challenge is going to be that by the year 2050, we want to make all existing buildings net zero energy. Again, this is a this is a, a plan to to solve the climate change dilemma, which could be a catastrophe. So US homeowners, you could say, well, Steve's given us until 2050 to convert our homes to net zero energy. I'm gonna slide by for the next 30 years and let the next homeowner worry about it kind of thing is no, I think we need leadership. Otherwise this is always gonna be just a vision, just gonna be goals. Need people to actually start doing this, and we, you know, I think we need to aspire for a vision of one where every home and every building becomes a mini power plant. Every home has solar panels on it. We don't need to have one massive power plant 50 miles away generating all the electricity for us, and then moving it across the grid to to all of us. Don't we want a model that's more akin to the internet? With the internet, is there one massive plant somewhere that's feeding our ability to, to get on the internet? No, there's millions and millions and millions of nodes out there that make up a very resilient grid. So as we're planning for the 21st century, we need to be thinking about every, every home and building was in many power plants, it would be more like the internet. So I wrote a book, uh, CEO Power and Light, a uh, year and a half ago, and it's about so much of what I'm just now talking about. My thought was that if I can educate and inspire business leaders who are, who have the greatest influence and resources to drive change through their organizations, you know, I was taking a very targeted approach. But I always submit to you that all of you in some way is a CEO. Some of you are CEOs at your home. Some of you are CEOs at your department, at your company. And that all of us can rise to the level of being a CEO to make the smart choices that I'm making the case for. In my lifetime, the coolest thing that's ever happened was sending man to the moon. And um, you know, this this challenge technologically was, in my mind, infinitely more challenging than what I'm proposing to do by just being smarter, committing ourselves to the goals, and making them happen. If we can go to the moon, we can do what we did here at this company a million times over so much more easily. This photo, believe it or not, no one knew what Mother Earth looked like until 1968, December, when um, the Apollo, I think it was uh, 10, before landing on the moon, we first had to actually go out to the moon, orbit around it, and we did the slingshot going around the moon, and as we were coming back, this is what the astronauts saw in their face. This was the first image of seeing what a beautiful, what an amazing planet because in the midst of everything else, all they could see was black. And to the degree that they could see any planets, the planets were brown and, you know, there was no sign of light or color or anything. To see all this color, blue, green, white, um, it, it, it really started the environmental movement. And um, so I, I love this image as a, a one to, um, to share with all of you. And then for me, I mean, my kids are everything, and um, you know, increasingly, the older I get, my legacy is the most important thing I can leave. And I just want to make sure, again, that I'm doing the right thing by them, and I'll be on the right side of history as this problem gets ever more serious. So my father, you know, he and my mother, I mean, they, they together endured the um, Great Depression, uh, World War II. Um, and the uh, Cold War, but I mean, my father, I mean, he went to Europe, fought World War II, 
And he, he, he did what he had to do to save our country and, in fact, save the world. And I think that climate change is going to be World War II in slow motion times 100. And it's worth us taking out insurance policies, making the right decisions now, so that we don't end up looking like idiots 50 years from now. So leadership matters. Think globally, but it's not enough just to think and talk and go to meetings every month and so much of that kind of stuff is happening. We need action. And um, you know, one thing that's interesting to me also is that so much of our education is about left brain activities. We want you to be skilled in math or engineering or nursing um, or whatever field. And it's all left brain thinking. We need more um, focus on developing all the right brain thought processes of what is the right thing to do, what's the ethical thing to do, um, when is leadership necessary. What's the elephant in the room? Guess what? It's not Donald Trump, it's not the utilities, it's not the fossil fuel companies, it's all of us. We're the elephant in the room. We're the ones that are preventing the kin energy revolution from, from realizing its full potential. Because we're like drug addicts. We're addicted to dirty power. And we'll do anything to pay for it and just not have to worry about it and just keep on getting our bills every month and not worrying. So to every problem, there's two sides. And again, we can cast blame, but all of us have the capacity to solve the problem at the individual level. And by doing so, your neighbors, your fellow workers, your community is going to learn from it because that's, that's been one of the, the key learnings that I've had from what we've done. We've been on such an interesting journey the last 10 years since we built this building and none of it was planned out. It's happened by accident. And I know that as you decide to invest in these kind of things and make smart choices, you're going to influence people beyond your imaginings. Conclusion is, the revolution has begun. It's happening. America risks losing it, though. Number two, you can lead or follow. If you follow, it's too late. And zero energy is doable today. If we can do it, anybody can. Thank you. So I'm, I'm willing to answer, post any questions if anyone has any. If not, um, after this, we're going to um, have a social thing out in the courtyard. We've got music, live music, I believe. we um, got some wine and cheese and some other nice things. We'd like to just hang around and network and, and talk to each other. But again, I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. starting to look at utility grid battery storage. What's your perception as you moved on of, uh, of entering that into the market now? It's the way of the future, like solar and wind. Um, I've reached out to Tesla. I'd love to be a distributor of their power pack, power wall solutions. Um, they seem to be going down the track of wanting to be their own uh, vertically integrated operation where they, they sell maybe through their Tesla dealerships, I'm not sure, but it, it seems very difficult to try to ally with them and become an extension of their their, their network. But um, we're looking at other opportunities. I mean, uh, everyone can see maybe this um, architect's rendering of the picture of our, of our campus. This is our current building, but we're already planning for building number two and three. But we absolutely want to have um, be part of the smart grid as we go into building two, so that if there's ever a power outage, we can remove ourselves from the grid and continue to operate and be able to store and win that we need. So, you know, more hospitals, just think that they are they they need energy more than probably any other type of operation out there. Um, but even 
even our customers, even the Walmarts and the Targets of the world, and they don't want to tell their customers to go away if there's a, a power outage. So um, I think it's a it's the way of the future. I, I want to get us on board as quickly as possible. Um, Craig, um, that's business number five. Okay. <laughs> Not specifically, but I agree 100 percent that fresh water is going to be a, a huge problem in the 21st century. Wars will be started for the lack of fresh water. And in my opinion, I can do the most good by continuing to focus on the energy side of that equation because as long as we can provide energy, we can make water from ocean water to desalination. So um, it's, you know, I'm not specifically targeting um, the reduction of, of fresh water or anything like that, but I, I do see that kind of what we're doing dovetails nicely into helping solve that other problem. Yes? And Steve, what's happening locally in Cincinnati in regards to the implementation of storage? Is there you know, centralization on homeowners getting close? Uh, does Tesla's solar I, I don't know that. I will say that because we're focused on the commercial building industry, I don't have as good of a handle on what's happening in residential solar. I love the idea that Tesla is trying to integrate uh, the technology into the roof um, tiles so that it doesn't look like you've got your mounting separately panels on top of the tiles. So that, that's the way of the future. In fact, there's something, a concept called BIPV, Building Integrated Photovoltaics, where the whole building facade, at some point in the future, should be a solar collector. The walls, the windows, the roof, everything should be capturing the energy from the sun and um, utilizing it. But um, I will say this, Ed, that the cost of solar has come down like 80% over the last five years. and um, I think increasingly you're going to see more and more suppliers seeing the opportunity and um, the supply chain will, will develop. And um, I, mean, I know there's a few local companies that do residential solar, but I mean, again, um, we're, we're focused on the commercial side. I mean, our goal is to have every Walmart, Target, McDonald's, Starbucks, they have solar um, on the rooftops. But, but again, some of these chains are they're already moving ahead of our ability to Help you that so, yes. You just said that you're you're focused on the commercial industry. Are are you interested in getting in the uh, industrial, chemical, pharmaceutical industries? If you have yes, if so if you've got a, a large facility that you would like to help green up, we would love to talk to you. Um, you know specifically what we have right now. We've got four business units. Well, we have an HVAC commissioning service that we do for uh, chains across the country. Um, we are a, a manufacturer of kitchen hood controls, kind of a niche you know, market that we kind of carved out for ourselves. We're a solar PV developer, and we have, we're a ge geothermal HVAC uh, provider. So I mean, I, I'd say that most businesses here probably don't need our kitchen hood controls, and you may not need our HVAC testing and balancing, but I think every building, every home, should at some point in time be should have geothermal, um, HVAC, and solar PV. Geothermal, by the way, it's, it's 30 to 50 percent more energy efficient than conventional heating and cooling systems. So imagine you're going to be able to save 30 to 50 percent more um, in heating and cooling your, your building. And we, we can't go forever just doing you know, what we're currently doing. So I, I believe I, I, we started this fourth business believing that that industry is primed for going mainstream. We think it's 10 years behind solar PV, but geothermal is the way of the future. Um, 
as a sort. So yeah, well, interested in talking afterwards. Sure. Yes, Michael. Yeah, I'm sure hydro storage of, of clean energy. So like where you have uh, solar power and part of that during the day is pumping all over to a higher level. Is that applicable to say a single campus like that or is that only big? Right? You know, I, I haven't studied um, the different options available in terms of energy storage enough. Um, I guess I was I'm more inclined to go to battery storage as opposed to the hydro approach, just because I think it would be more applicable to our customers. I don't think a Walgreens, for example, is going to do something like that at their local store. No, I think, but no, I absolutely put lithium-ion batteries in their stores. But maybe for some applications, maybe there's a cost savings, efficiency saving on gain. I'm not sure. I can't speak to that. Yes. How soon do you think we'll see a, a solid state lithium battery? So I'm still at the early stages of investigating the whole battery storage concept, so I um, wish I could say more about that. So. All right, you, you guys, women, and everybody have been um, very patient listeners. I appreciate you coming here and learning more about uh, us and our journey and our, our mission. And I uh, hope you'll be able to stay and network and enjoy the